show of hands. How many people have picked up a psychology textbook or, or studied psychology before? Quick show of hands here. A couple of folks. Okay. Uh, there was a Harvard University prof in the late 1800s and early 1900s. His name's William James. One of the things that uh, William James said in his very early texts was, the greatest discovery we've made in my lifetime, which is his lifetime, uh, is the human beings, we, can change our external circumstances by changing what we think about. Does that make sense? Or if you put it another way, uh, what you think about changes the way you feel, true or false? True. The way you feel changes the way you act, true or false? True. The way you act changes your outcome, true or false? So what we think about changes our outcome. Now, I've had the good fortune of chatting with a bunch of folks before we get going today, you know, meeting people in the halls and things, and, and this looks like a relatively scientific-minded group, and I've been asking around, you know, can, can we try sort of a, a scientific, can we try social experiments? People, oh, yeah, sure, let's try that. It's dark. No one can see us anyway. So we're going to try a little social experiment. And don't worry, I'll show you where I'm going with this in a second. Uh, on the count of three, I'd like to see if we can get all of us in the room uh, to join together in something we'll call a, uh, a nice, polite golf clap on the count of three. Sure, yeah, I see a couple of people. Oh, golf clap, yeah. If you don't know what a golf clap is, I want you to think of the last time you saw, um, I don't know, maybe it was a boss of yours or maybe you were at a conference, you had to clap anyway, but it wasn't very good. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so on the count of three, we'll do this very nice, polite golf clap, and don't worry, I'll show you where we're going with this. Ready? One, two, three. Very nice. Bravo, that'll play. Bravo. <laughs> I love doing this. I love doing this. It doesn't matter what city you try this in. Uh, I was in Red Deer, Alberta in the wintertime. Quick aside, you ever been to Red Deer, Alberta in the wintertime? I was there. I asked them, what do you guys do here in the wintertime? The guy goes, we leave. Huh. Good call. So I took off. But I'm in Red Deer. Same thing happened just like right here. I, I say, let's try this golf clap. Every single person in the room, just like right here. You're staring right at me, and your facial expression's going, okay, whatever. <laughs> and about half the people in the room, and I get it, you're staring right at me, and your facial expression says, oh, what if this whole thing sucks? Fortunately, it won't suck. But what is interesting is the thoughts that we put into our head or the thoughts that we allow others to put into our head change how we feel, which always change how we act, which always change our outcome. So let's take our little experiment a step further. Uh, and instead of just a, a random quiet golf clap this time, on the count of three, I want to see if we can make more noise than this room has ever heard before. I can see three people like, okay. <laughs> you get 400 other people going, oh, really? This is a very soon. Take your hands out from under your seats. On the count of three, we're going to make a ton of noise in this room. Now, this time is part of our little social experiment. Instead of staring right at me, I'd like you to glance around the room. I'd like you to make eye contact with other people here at TEDx IB at York. And I'd like you to think about two things. One, what's everybody's face doing while we're trying this little social experiment? Uh, and two, does it change how it feels in this room? We will debrief after our experiment. <laughs> yes, we're actually doing this. Tons of noise on three. I'm talking about banging on the floor, stomp, do whatever you have to do. Don't kick over the water bottles if the lids are off. One, yes, we're actually going to do this. Cheer, holler, whistle, do whatever you have to do. Glance around the room. Two, here it comes, bring it on, go completely nuts. <gasps> three, bravo! Whoa, <laughs> that was a lot of work, man, I don't know. Okay, did you glance around the room? Yes, what was everybody's face doing? At least smiling, if not laughing. Now, I have the luxury, I can stand up here, I can see everybody at once. Uh, I'm not going to call on you, it's none of my business, but I saw a couple of people. I said, on the count of three, we're going to make a ton of noise. They're like, I'm not. <laughs> and you can see their face. They say, okay, one, here goes two, and let's do this, three. And you can see that, oh, we're actually, we're actually doing this. All right, fine, I guess. We'll. And, uh, and I can hear what's going on in their mind because I can see their face. And you can see their face. They're kind of going, they're talking to me quietly. Chris, I'm not going to smile. It's not going to happen. Oh, there it is, dude. Huh? <laughs> is, is passion contagious? Is, this, is enthusiasm contagious? Yeah, in a big way. Now, that affects our mindset. Now, we can let others affect our mindset, and we can, in fact, infect other people's mindset. So, as Maureen said, I, I want to tell you a little bit about a couple of people who have inspired me. And uh, I'll start off. At the University of Western Ontario, I lived in uh, residence. 
32 people on the floor my first year. 16 guys, 16 girls. 15 guys, myself included, are uh, we're in the TV lounge watching the hockey game. You picture this? 15 guys watching the hockey game. We're throwing stuff at each other, pizza crusts and other things. This guy named Stefan comes bouncing into the lounge, and he's like, I'm so excited. And we're watching the hockey game. We're like, security, we got a weirdo. <laughs> so someone asks, okay, uh, what's your name? Stefan. Oh, what are you so excited about, Stefan? He says, well, I, that's the wrong room to tell it to, 15 guys watching the hockey game. I am going to the Celine Dion concert. <laughs> and all of us are like, and we're going to miss that. Too bad. Now, he had a decision to make. He could decide, you know, I better blend in with everybody else, or he could decide, you know what, I'm, I don't need you clowns. I'm going after this anyway. So he goes to the Celine concert. Comes back from the Celine Dion concert. He's not just excited now. The guy's on cloud nine. He's bouncing off the walls. And it, by this time, the hockey game's over. I think we're watching basketball highlights or something. And, uh, and he comes back into the lounge, and he's just bouncing. What are you so excited about? Well, I went to the Celine concert. Yeah, we know that part. What else? Well, I got, <laughs> I got to meet her. I met Celine Dion. And all of us are like, wow, when we missed that too, what are you going to do? And they said, you know what else, guys? No, no, step around the edge of our seat. Here, just move out of the way of the TV. Uh, what else? We're curious. They said, well, I told, I told Celine I'm going to write a song for her one day. And we're like, right. There you are. <laughs> Good luck with that. A lot of us, when we saw him on campus, were like, hey, how's that song coming? A lot of people in, in your life are going to try to talk you out of things, too. A lot of people are going to say, well, come on, get your head out of the clouds. And you know how hard it is to make it in the music business? It's really hard. Do you know how really, it's really hard to do that thing you want to do? Lots of people are going to do that. People did that to Steph. And he said, thanks, appreciate your input. I'm going to go after it anyway. Over the course of a number of years, he was able to fall at the feet of a guy named David Foster. Gifted Canadian. Kind of exciting. David says, sure, I, I can introduce you to some folks. He meets some people within Sony Music, and wouldn't you know, he starts writing some music at Sony Music in Canada. Then you fast forward a bunch of years. Not that many, though, because I still had my student vehicle. <laughs> you guys ever been in a $1,000 student vehicle? <laughs> There's no GPS in there. <laughs> 1000 bucks burns more oil than gas. I'm driving along in my uh, $1,000 car at a time when I had slightly misplaced priorities. See, I had a $1,000 car and a $1,000 cell phone. <laughs> Some of you might be too young to remember, but we had the Motorola 650E, and it flipped open and had this big flippy antenna on it. And it was actually, it was at a time we didn't have cool ringtones either. We didn't have, like, <laughs> ringtones. We had this, <laughs> this really loud. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I think it had two. You could do, like, that or, <laughs> or if you got this big one, <laughs> I got to download the ringtone. So anyway, I'm driving along my 86 Plymouth Horizon, $1,000 car. I got my $1,000 cell phone. Zip along the 427 in Toronto. And the phone rings. And this was at a time when it was exceptionally cool to say, what's up? <laughs> Do you remember this? It's not cool anymore. Who knew? So I pick up the phone. And I, and I put it my what's up? And it was this guy named Rolando Contreras Rojo. His name's Rolo. He lived in Res with us. Uh, he said, what's up? And I said, what's up? Back and forth a couple times. Then I stopped. <gasps> That just cost me four bucks. <laughs> Cut to the chase. What do you want? And he, and he goes, uh, hey, man, are you near a radio? And I said, yeah. He goes, put it to 99.9. It was a mix 99.9 at the time. He said, put it to 99.9. So I did. And he goes, can you hear that, man? And I said, yeah, it sounds like Celine Dion. What the heck are you calling me for? Long pause on the other end of the phone. And he goes, Cummins, guess who wrote the song? Now, he wrote the music for the song. But in fact, this ended up being Celine, from what I understand, it's Celine Dion's second biggest hit ever so far. It's called A New Day Has Come. Now, this is interesting. If you've got the CD, flip it over in the back. Song credit, Stefan Macchio. He wrote it. Now, it turns out Celine Dion's uh, big Vegas show was called A New Day Has Come. Stefan Macchio, from the second he decided he wanted to write a song for it, wouldn't take no for an answer. Now, this happened over a course of a bunch of years. My wife and I got to go see him when he opened for the Canadian Tenors. We sat in the second row or so, not unlike this room. He comes up to play his piano piece, sits down at the piano. My wife and I are sitting in the second row right there. Plays a piece, pulls the microphone toward himself, looks at the audience and says, my first year at the University of Western Ontario. I get my jacket. Oh, my gosh, he sees me. <laughs> my wife's like, is that the guy? Like, yes, shh, quiet. 
He proceeds to tell the story. The pizza crust. We're talking, you know, I went in the lounge to do. So I decided I've got to go say hi to the guy. So I, I walk back to the, uh, the side of the stage. And excuse me, pardon me, sorry. Uh, I don't want to go meet him. The bouncer was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But he says they're with him. And no, he really knows me. And he looks over. He goes, Chris Cummins. I said, see, wow, cool. So I asked him. I said, you know, what, what did you do? Like, tell me something. I'm telling your story. It's kind of inspiring. You know, how did it go? And he said, well, I'm not going to tell you how much money I made. I said, no, we don't need that. But he said, royalties are quite good. <laughs> this bugs me. I'm kidding. Now, we go backstage, and I start asking him, give me some ideas. Like, oh, what the heck? He said, Chris... If you want to do something badly enough, don't let anybody talk you out of it. And whatever you do, don't, don't talk yourself out of it. Instead, find passionate people who want to do what you want to do, or find people who've already done what you want to do, and then copy them, or fall at their feet and learn from them. Another person I want to tell you about, a lady named Hilda, school teacher in Sweden. She decides, I don't have a lot of money, but things are going well for me, so I, I think I can donate about, we'll round it up, it's about $10 a month. So she decides to donate 10 bucks a month uh, to a, uh, an education system in Kenya. So she puts it on this automatic payment thing. She starts cutting checks, $10 a month, to go pay for an education in Kenya. It turns out the money started to go to a guy named Chris Mburu. Chris Mburu is from a relatively large family, couldn't afford his... Um, uh, school fees, so gratefully accepted this $10 a month. Now Hilda, at this point, she forgets all about the $10 a month, doesn't give it another thought at all. Well, Chris and Buru gives it lots of thought. In fact, he takes this $10 a month gift and decides, I'm going to go apply this. So he goes to school, he finishes high school near the top of his class, goes to university in Nairobi, almost the top of his class in Nairobi. He ends up with a Fulbright scholarship to, a, um, uh, to Harvard Law School. Little guy from Kenya. Goes to Harvard Law School, gets involved with the United Nations. The nice people of the United Nations have a rather large office in New York. He works in New York. He then, he's now uh, based in Geneva. Uh, Chris Mburu, in fact, now, uh, as of this week, he's in Rwanda. Now, what he does is several things. Uh, he uh, works on truth and, reconcili uh, truth and reconciliation um, programs. Uh, he also, uh, in some cases, hires judges and, and starts uh, help, helping build judiciary, judicial systems. All because one lady named Hilda, Hilda Back, decided, I'm, I'm going to give 10 bucks. And just, I'll see if I can help. Now, here's what happened. See, Chris decided, well, I need to find a way to, uh, to add more to this. So he decides that I'm going to start uh, an organization. In fact, I want to help people the way I was helped. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pool some of my resources and some of my cousins, some other relatives, and we're going we're gonna to help a couple more kids. This will be fantastic. And in fact, just as a thank you to this lady named Hilda, I'm going to start the Hilda Back Education Fund. Kind of exciting. He finds Hilda Back through the um, uh, embassy and through some other sources. He actually tracks her down in Sweden, ends up flying Hilda Back from Sweden to his town in Kenya for the big launch of the Hilda Back Education Fund. They have hundreds of students there. It's kind of an exciting time. The story doesn't end there, though. You see, a director named Jennifer Arnold heard about the Hildeback Education Fund and heard about a guy named Chris Mburu. So she decided, hey, can I, can I follow you with my cameras? Do you mind, do you mind if, I just, uh, if I just come along? I think it was about a year or so, maybe a year and a half of filming. So Jennifer Arnold and her team follow Chris Mburu and the Hildeback Education Fund as it grows. They create a documentary called A Small Act. They finish the documentary called A Small Act. And uh, they start shopping it around to a couple of places. And Robert Redford runs a, a program called the Sundance Film Festival. Have you heard of it? Sundance Film Festival sees a little trailer. Like, you know what? Well, that'd be great. Yep, let's get, in, that's, let's get that into our Sundance Film Festival. It's called A Small Act. Google it if you have to. It's just asmallact.com. You can also go to Netflix, apparently. It's on there now, too, which is kind of exciting. So it shows at Robert Redford's Sundance Film Festival. Well, who happens to be in the audience but a whole lot of interesting and fascinating people, one of whom which is Bill Gates. Bill Gates is in the audience, sees that, and waiting for Superman and some other ideas about investing and changing education systems. Chris and Buru gets to meet uh, Mr. Gates, gets a photograph with him, and then meets a whole bunch of other philanthropists as well, and they decide, you know what, let's, let's, put, let's get legs on this thing. Let's really do this. I drove Chris to the airport last week, and uh, he was telling me, Chris, this is fascinating. I have a full-time job uh, at the United Nations, uh, and now I'm being flown all over the world, he was telling me last week, uh, to go tell people about the Hildeback Education Fund. 
In fact, the Hildeback Education Fund now is thinking, uh, is planning to start to build schools uh, and to, to do massive outreach. In fact, they've just hired a massive, massive team of people on the ground there, and they've got people on boards uh, around the world. This all started with a small act. Not a grandiose thing. Hildeback didn't sit down and say, I'm going to go change the universe. Dun, 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 dun. She sat down and said, you know what, I can give back. I, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'll give $10. And often we get disillusioned. We think in order to change the world, I have to do big things. I'm going to do that and that and those things over there too. You going to do them today? No, 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 no. Busy today. <laughs> Besides, they scare the crap out of me. You don't have to do these massive grandiose plans. In fact, often it starts with a small act. It's a little thing like helping someone else to believe in themselves. In fact, you can do this every single day. If you do nothing more than just help other people to feel better about themselves, go sit with somebody when they're sitting by themselves at lunch, make them feel part of a group, make someone feel included, make people feel important. You help people to believe in their dreams when no one else will. You tell someone you believe in them, watch what happens. I believe in every single person in this room. If you want to make change to yourself, you want to make change to a school, to a city, to a province, to a country, to the world. It really starts with small acts, and I believe every single person in the room can do that, because they'll morph. Maybe your small act is going to light up someone else's passion. Maybe it's going to light up someone else's passion through them, and you won't even know the impact that you've had. But it all starts with mindset. In fact, it's one of my favorite quotes of all time was uh, Henry Ford. I'll paraphrase. He said, whether you think you can or you think you cannot, either way, you're right. I believe it was Margaret Mead that said, never doubt that a small group of concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Three people I wanted to tell you about, Stefan Macchio, I'm very proud of that guy. He went from a little dream to building a massive music empire. Hilda Back, a little lady in little Sweden, decided, you know what, I'll give 10 bucks. She had a massive impact on the world through Chris Mburu because his passion was ignited by somebody who cared. My name is Chris Cummins. I believe every single person in this room, if you take the time to care and help light someone else's passion, will set this world on fire. Thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it.